I'm really excited to, you know, have this conversation around reality capture. And frankly, I know that everybody on the line is probably more excited to see, you know, what Matt at Langan is doing with reality capture solutions instead of listening to me. So I'm really going to try to keep it um, a, a little bit short. We'll, we'll keep it maybe to about 20 minutes. That gives um, Matt plenty of time to, to go over some of, you know, the amazing work they're doing showcasing reality capture solutions and Autodesk tools. But uh, my name is George Hatch. I am a senior technical specialist at Autodesk. I cover the East Coast of the U.S. I do focus on what we call ENI, which is engineering, natural resources, and infrastructure products. Uh, but my degrees in architecture, all my industry experience really focuses in on GIS civil engineering, with also some CFD and simulation experience. And you know, it seems like kind of a broad um, background. Maybe I couldn't make up my mind, but that wasn't at all the case. Uh, I really am passionate about multidiscipline collaboration. Uh, and the reality capture conversation really is exactly that. Uh, and you'll see more about that as we continue on with this presentation. So uh, I get, I'm pretty passionate about, about this topic and about what Autodesk is doing to you to help customers capture the real world as it exists in context. So uh, with that, let's just start with the, you know, understanding that this is, you know, this is Revit, right? This is the way we start almost all of our projects inside of Revit. And some of you may have, uh, you know, templates that maybe give you a little bit more building blocks, but you still don't have any information regarding the project when we start it. We start with a blank slate. And the idea is we don't want to do that. Uh, we want to actually start with something in context. So ideally, maybe we start with a scan in this case. And this is an interior scan of a, um, a workshop area. You've probably seen this video before. And if you haven't, then, you know, yay, I get to show it to you for the first time. But uh, the value of having the scan data there from the very beginning is that we don't start with a blank slate anymore. There isn't a lot of questions about what exists, and it's only about what we're going to do with the space. Now, that could also mean that we've got a, you know, a greenfield site, and it's just a scan of the site. Um, but I know that a lot of us uh, are working on renovation projects. Scanning and renovation projects, you know, I spend most of my most of my time on horizontal construction projects. That's what I focus in on. But like I said, with my degree in architecture and having these multidiscipline conversations, I've gotten to interview enough customers to know that many are doing renovations rather than brand new building. So scanning makes a lot of sense. The materials, um, all of the context of that project is right at your fingertips and right there. So um, let's just, I'm just going to let this video play out and I'll talk over it. Uh, it's, you know, typical marketing uh, video, but there's a lot of value to understand behind the process. So uh, this, this video shows the process of using a Faro scanner. I think this is a Faro 330. I, I, um, I, I don't know because I didn't do the work and I haven't watched the video in enough detail to know what model the Faro unit is. No, 130. Uh, wait, whatever. Doesn't really matter. Uh, this is a Faro unit that we're going to use to scan interior of a building. Now, uh, I'm working with a Delaware DOT actually in doing some scans with them using a 330 of salt sheds. So this could be a multitude of different types of projects. But the idea is you set up this scanner in multiple locations, and then you use our technology to rapidly bring those of those cloud point clouds together through a process called registration. Uh, I'm going to skip this because I'm going to show you a little bit more about the registration process. But ultimately, you end up with individual scans becoming one large scan and, and of course, becoming a uh, full point cloud that we have control over, not just viewing as an entire point cloud, but also being able to view, as you can see here, from something called real view. 
We also have the ability to section off this point cloud and identify planes and objects within the point cloud to help clean it up. And I would call this process the process of, of um, you know, object recognition. Although it, right now, as it stands today, that process is fairly manual. There are some third-party tools that will help you to automate that process, but I know that, you know, we're very interested here at Autodesk in making that uh, more of an automated process direct and product than, uh, than you know, using something third-party. So uh, let's skip this video. Let's talk about the Recap product line. I intentionally, I don't have Recap as it sits by itself um, on this slide because Recap right now that comes in the suite uh, is, is a free tool, really. Um, you can use it as a, basically a point cloud viewer. Um, Recap 360 is the tool that we use to process um, photo-based process. So Recap 360 is going to allow us to um, process photos in the cloud, photos to a model, and have a point cloud. It also helps us to share and collaborate on with point clouds, maybe sh share that point cloud with stakeholders, uh, help with markups, um, help with, uh, with um, what we call our true view and things like that, and of course, publishing to the cloud. Recap 360 Ultimate is our targetless scan to scan registration tool. Um, so kind of the old nomenclature was that Recap or Recap 360 was just photo-based and maybe some collaboration in Recap 360. Um, Ultimate used to be called Recap Pro. You may have heard it called that in the in the past. Um, and now it's been enhanced quite a bit. Not just do we have targetless registration, which I'll chat about in a moment, but we also have this thing called auto registration that right now I believe is in beta mode, and I'll have to, to confirm that. But But basically it's, going to automatically register your points based off of the scans themselves. So you don't even have to identify targets. Um, it's not perfect. It will, it, what it will do is it will identify groups if it can, and then you can align those groups. Uh, but we can, since we can also tie to survey control uh, and create reports based off of those targets or survey controls, then that means that we actually have the ability to check the registration rather than just letting Recap do it and hope that it's accurate. If we do have targets, we can use them to refine our registration. So the idea of um, Recap for laser scanning is that we go out, we do our laser scan, uh, we bring this into Recap um, 360 Ultimate, so we bring it in, register the points, and index for outputs to our hero products. And that may be Revit, maybe AutoCAD, Map3D, Inventor, Civil 3D, um, Navisworks. Uh, it could be InfraWorks, which I don't have on here. Uh, but it also could be a, for export and share out to Recap 360. And because Recap 360 Ultimate, uh, sits on top of our Recap 360 platform, we can then utilize the same license that we own to share the point cloud with other stakeholders or people within the company. I'm just doing a quick time check. All right, um, we're good to go. So uh, once the, the data is into the, the value of the data is really getting that into these hero products. Uh, and, and we'll chat about why that value is so important. Okay, so recaps really one of the, the key things to understand inside of recap, and this is a video that's been around for a little while, is its ability to rapidly clean up uh, a point cloud. So identifying areas, in this case, maybe I wanna identify and single out just that piece of machinery. Now, um, it's some sort of hammer, I forget what those things are called, but you know, I, I wanna identify that machinery 
And basically, we can put that into these things called groups or regions, or we can just delete the points altogether. You notice that what we deleted that altogether, and when we come back, now that machinery is gone from the scan and therefore would be gone inside of uh, my uh, Civil 3D or my Revit experience as well. So, Recap 360 Ultimate, that should say Recap 360 Ultimate, not Pro, um, allows us to do something far beyond just editing the point cloud. In the past, we would typically, when we get into scanning, you'd have to, you would have to, no matter what, you'd have to go out and set up all of these different targets. Um, and those targets were critical, absolutely critical to the process of registering the scans together, meaning stitching each individual scan location together so you get one entire point cloud. Um, and if for some reason you did not put up a target in an area and it was needed and you didn't realize that until the end of the day, um, then the process of adding it and then having it still register was almost a nightmare. Um, so, uh, what we've done is we've removed the need the need for targets. Targets can still be useful, but we've removed the need for target through really easy what we call targetless registration. And the targetless registration looks just like this. So this is a Starbucks, right? Uh, it was scanned. We're viewing a single scan location. We selected that as our home point. And now I'm going to just use common points inside of the two scan locations to help register. You notice that this is not a perfect process. It doesn't have to be, you know, I'm where I'm selecting down to uh, the finest pixel. I can also select in 2D plan. So you'll see here, looking down at two-dimensional, plan view, I can pick these common points, and in this case, I really only need two. As I pick my second point on the second scan, uh, which would be here, and for some reason this video stopped playing, um, those will also register. So I would go down the line and register each one of those through this registration process. Now, in the, the new version of RECAP, um, we have the auto registration process that will automate that process for you. Um, what you see here, though, is that just because we have target lists or an auto registration process doesn't mean that the targets are still not valuable. Uh, they're not needed, but they're still very valuable, uh, allowing us to then generate what we call target reports. So to be able to see in the survey world what I would call my, my closure report, uh, be able to see the accuracy of the registration in conjunction with the, these targets themselves, to be able to see, okay, I, I did a auto registration on this scan. Um, you know, these two different scan location pick up or three different scan locations pick up a target, you know, what is the level of accuracy of that target location based on the three different positions, a four or six or eight or a hundred? Um, I'd, I'd love to see a, a target that was visualized a hundred times. That'd be amazing. Um, but the, the value of the targets is still important to the process. So I want to just fast forward this video just so you can see. Um, so this is, da, 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 there we go, target enhanced registration. This is the target enhanced registration process where we set up the same same scanner. This is our Pier 9 um, facility down in San Francisco. Those are our, our, um, our uh, different, two different types of targets and uh, you know, the traditional paper targets versus our um, circular uh, or ball targets, and I'm forgetting what those are called technically. Uh, Matt will probably correct me because you guys probably use those, Matt. Um, 
but that's okay. Uh, then when we go through the registration process, you can see I can tag those individual targets and tie survey control to them as well if I knew a surveyed geolocation uh, or state plane or I want to tie it into another survey known point um, because there's still traditional survey process. Then once I'm done, I can then look at uh, my traditional registration data as well as all of my uh, registration based on the targets and refine that that um, registration based on the targets themselves instead of my manual process. All right, just in the essence of time, I'm going to skip through here uh, because I want to make sure we give enough time for uh, Matt. And I want to talk to you about Recap 360's photo-based process. Okay, so when we think about Autodesk and, you know, photogrammetry technology, uh, you know, in the past people have used a tool like 123D Catch. Um, you know, more and more customers are starting to use the photo on a Recap 360 process. And just so you know, the interface looks a little different than this icon shows. Uh, and then some of you may also be using Project, what was called Project Memento, and now is a beta tool, uh, still technically under labs license terms, agreements, and conditions. It is free. Um, Recap 360 comes with, you know, you pay cloud credits per um, ultimate model that you are going to publish. Uh, but there's a lot of different uh, functionality based on these different types of photogrammetry tools. Once you 3D catch, is really consumer grade, and that's something that I would I would use with my, you know, my daughter. Um, I also use Recap 360 with my seven-year-old daughter. She loves it. She thinks that it's the coolest tool. Uh, but I use Recap 360 for a lot of other different types of purposes, like creating stockpile volumes for DOTs or to be able to capture facades of buildings. Uh, and Memento is our master mesh tool that allows us to be able to edit the mesh coming out of Recap 360. Now, the process looks just like this. You take the photos with whatever, you know, camera you choose, whether it's a GoPro or a DSLR or even your iPhone uh, or Android for those Android users out there. Uh, publish the photos into Recap 360. And what you get out from Recap 360 is one of, you know, multiple different file formats. You can get a point cloud, which is an RCS. You can get an, a mesh, which is an RCM. You can also, just so you know, get an, a direct FBX export from Recap 360 or OBJ. And if this was an aero project, you can actually get the ortho image created from your drone flight as well, uh, which really, uh, I literally, I was almost late to this webcast because I was going over results with a customer that is doing just that, flying a drone of a large site, and, and they're getting the TIFF images along with uh, 3D scan data just from the drone flight. Um, but the mesh data is what goes into Memento, and then we can do all kinds of editing in Memento. I won't get into the details of Memento on this call. There's other webcasts for that. Um, but then we can ultimately push that to multiple different sources, including 3D printing. Uh, but the point clouds is where we would start to use point cloud data inside of products like Navisworks or Revit or Civil 3D or Inventor. So some of you may have seen this video, and I'm going to um, just let this play out for, for a moment. But basically, uh, Dominic is, is an Autodesk employee. He had a, a drone, uh, this is actually the same drone that I currently use um, for proof of concept, just this a Phantom with a GoPro uh, strap to it. And he flew this uh, bunker with the GoPro, just taking pictures every two to five seconds. Uh, and what comes back is a full 3D 
point cloud of the bunker itself. It's the same process. Drag and drop all of your photos onto Recap 360. Eventually, the project, once it's submitted, you get an email back saying, it's good to go, you're ready. And this is what you get back, a full 3D point cloud of the project, or it could be a 3D object to insert into products like InfraWorks or um, Navisworks or Max, uh, or it could be the RCM to bring into mesh. But we've now accurately captured reality just with a picture. Well, in this case, it was probably about 200 pictures, but it's pictures. It's things that I can do as an end user without having, you know, very advanced knowledge. Uh, now, I've been doing some work with Delaware uh, DOT on the process of gathering point clouds uh, with the same GoPro approach, but remove the drone, okay? Uh, so basically what I'm showing here is a video of me walking around, setting up a couple of cones that I know are a specific distance apart, and then I mount the GoPro to the top of a really big painter stick. And I walk around the stockpile. Now, just to be clear, this stockpile was not a large stockpile, but I had done this on, you know, 50 foot, 40 foot stockpiles. And what we're replacing is a workflow where surveyors would need to climb up on that stockpile. It's dangerous. Um, they need to get their equipment up there. If they're scanning it, now you're dragging a 40 to $150,000 piece of equipment up on top of the stockpile uh, and running the risk of dropping it. Uh, whereas this process, then all you need to do is take the photos from the GoPro mounted on a painter stick in this case, load them up to Recap 360, and when you get the Recap point cloud back down, this is what you end up with, uh, which is a, a you start a brand new project bring that point cloud into recap through this new project. You'll see, I'm gonna select it here. That was the download. I go, maybe I input some advanced options like a coordinate system. Uh, but since I've already registered it on recap and said, okay, this is you know my distance from A to B, it's already scaled it. And now I can start to utilize this point cloud from photos on a painter stick. Uh, into Recap um, or into Civil 3D or into Revit or into, uh, yeah, into Civil 3D and used for volumes. That's really the, the key to this workflow um, for stockpiles. All right, so here's the, the you know, a couple of quick closing comments before I pass it over to Matt, which is, you know, Recap's engine has changed quite a bit, and this this has increased quite a bit even from 2015, but in 2016, really, it's 2 billion points to 20 billion points from 2014 on. And I've tested the limits. I actually have the entire state of Rhode Island LIDAR data inside of a recap project, and I could bring that entire state into InfraWorks um, from LIDAR data. That, that's in, incomprehensible. I can bring it into Civil 3D, by the way, as well. Uh, and my Civil 3D models and moves, and it doesn't crash. <laughs> I'm an Autodesk employee, and I know, um, you know that not everything is perfect, but the fact that I can bring that amount of point data into a into any product and not crash my graphics card is a feat onto itself. So all of the products now support the 20 billion plus points inside of the point clouds because Recap Engine sits inside of AutoCAD, Navisworks, Revit, Inventor, 3ds Max, uh, whatever product you may be using. I'm going to um, skip through some of these because I, I want um, Matt to have a chance to to present, but I'm going to just kind of end my portion on on this slide and just show the video and talk to you about you know ultimately 
reality capture from Autodesk perspective and our tools is, is a no brainer at this point. Uh, whether it's buying a low cost scanner like a Faro um, to recreate existing scans of projects you're working on, or whether it's a photo based process, uh, there really is no excuse to not having enough data of your project in your site uh, to start your projects with. And being able to start a project without, a, without just a clean slate, but having existing conditions is really where the true value of this recap conversation comes into play. So with that, I'm going to push um, the presenter back over to Matt at Langen. How's everybody doing? My name is Matt Sipple. I'm from uh, Langen Engineering. Um, you know, actually, it was funny because I was looking back to see how long I've worked here, and I've been here for almost 13 years, and pretty much I've been working with scanning since I started here. So um, today, I'm going to give you just a rundown. You know, we've been so we've been scanning for I was, for about 12 years now, um, and I just wanted to give a, a run through, kind of expanding on what George was talking about with Autodesk, because Autodesk Recap has really changed the landscape of what we've done. And it's basically something we've been talking about. It, well, all right, so it came out two years ago. We've been talking about for 10 years, you know, some kind of format and, and recaps really, you know, changed a lot for us. Um, just a quick word about Langan. A lot of people out there know Langan. Langan's really well known for our geotech and civil engineering. And we also do a lot of environmental work as well. Um, but a lot of times, we start talking with people about what we do, and they say, yeah, we're with Langan. They're like, oh, Langan, I didn't know Langan did that. So I just figured I'd uh, put that out there. We have 26 offices worldwide. I'm just throwing this, telling everybody about this, because it's kind of important to know that we've done scanning in pretty much eight out of 18 of these offices, including two that we don't have offices in the Caribbean and in China. Now, all of these projects were done either with a lot of most of these projects, especially in the U.S., were done by you know our teams. We do a lot of work with uh, local subs and a lot of the international, just because the getting around with our equipment isn't always the easiest. But it's you know scanning is a really an international practice. It's becoming very commonplace now all over the world. You know, it's it's coming from owners, it's coming from architects, engineers, contractors. It's really covered a wide array of the industry. So why? Why is a surveyor talking about reality capture? We like the word reality capture. Autodesk is, since you put recap out, has really pushed re reality capture. And somebody asked me once, well, why are surveyors, why are you guys worrying about scanning? And if you think about it, typically what you see when you hear a surveyor is you see somebody on the side of the road or somebody on a construction site standing behind a total station doing who knows what, looking through the, you know, looking through the little glass. What they're doing is taking single points, measuring single points at a time. Every time they look through there, they point it to, I actually don't have a, a shot of somebody standing on a prison pole, because that's really not interesting. But they're taking individual shots, hundreds and hundreds of shots a day. If we get up to 1,000 shots a day, that is like a, a monumental day. That's like a, must be a 12-hour day. But they're basically surveyors have always been in the industry of reality capture. We're out there measuring, and what we're measuring is we're taking ground shots, 2D, coordinates and an elevation on every point that we take. And those points are reduced on, in, within programs. You can see on the side, like we have on the on my screen, I have some older, you know, like the, we used to use field books, then we use data collectors. And that basically is turned into a survey, which is passed over to an engineer or an architect to give them a lay of the land, which is essentially what reality capture is. So fast forward a couple of years and scanning comes out about about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, we really saw scanning coming out as, as a tool that was really pushed by a lot of hardware manufacturers. And this was the this was the big sell point is where traditionally you're getting up to a thousand points per day if it's you know like I said a very long day. All of a sudden these scanners are coming out and they're getting 10,000 points. And nowadays we have scanners that get a million points per second. So just imagine that that to a surveyor thing. Wow, I can get a million points a day. I kind of want to take a minute too to, to notice that there's been a lot of advancements in, tech, in technology. Since everything has been changing, the hardware over the years has been changing. There's been a lot of changes in the scanner, in the scanners. So, the first scanners that we got around 2003 up until around 2009 were all 
we call them dummy scanners because the scanner units themselves, they were big, they were very heavy, they had very big motors in it. There was no built-in batteries. Everything was run off a of computer and the scanners themselves had to be run off a generator. So in the beginning, the first six years of working in scanning, when you saw a lot of people sitting, you saw a lot of field guys sitting there crouched down over, over a laptop trying to get in the shade so they could see the screen scanning. And those scanners were very problematic. They were, I mean, excellent compared to what was out earlier, but there was still, there was a lot of problems, a lot of glitches, your, your generator would run out of gas, you had to carry around a, a you know, just having the gas generator. We were on a few sites where you had to bring, had to have somebody there with a fire extinguisher just because you had gasoline. There's, you know, all the uh, all the downsides of that. Then 2009 to the present, as you can see in the video down below, they changed the Leica, who we use most of our scanners from, came out with a new technology where there was a spinning mirror. So the laser, instead of using a strong motor that can only go up and down a certain amount, has it had a mirror that can go around a full 360 degrees, which really changed the landscape for the scanning. Now you have a, a, a computer, has a built-in computer, a built-in hard drive. It's going 360 degrees. Batteries are built in. You don't have to carry around a generator. You don't have to have a laptop. You have to worry about power supply. So that really changed the industry. The reason why I'm talking about these old scanners is because it's sort of, Nothing, not much is, I don't want to downplay like it, but not much has changed over the past since maybe 2009 with these technology. Scanners have gotten smaller, they've gotten faster. Like I said, we have up to a million points now, but there hasn't been that much change in the scanning industry because really there's how much faster can you scan? You get a million points a second. What, if you go to two million points a second, is that really going to, you know, really get you that much better? The biggest, the biggest challenge we've had in the scanning industry is what do we do with all this data? So I'm gonna go back again a few years to talk about the first times when we came out with scanning because it's kind of important, especially when talking about recap. So when we first got the scanners, we had to get, we call them supercomputers. Now, if you, if you saw the specs on those computers now, you'd probably laugh because they're, you know, you probably couldn't even buy them. You probably couldn't even get it for a hundred bucks now. But you needed these super powerful com computers just for opening up the point cloud. And a lot of the point clouds, point cloud was very new and you, there's only a few manufacturers out there that had actual programs that could support opening and running the point clouds. And keep in mind, this is 2003, 2004, 2005. Revit, even though it was out, it was not that popular yet. There was, weren't a lot of people talking about them. There were not a lot of companies that were used in 3D. And the biggest, big, one of the biggest challenges we had, so we bought one of these scanners, we start going around saying, hey, we get all this data, we get all this scan data. Well, we didn't, we didn't understand the architectural world. We were surveyors, we were used to doing parking lots and, and sites and walking around the woods. We didn't understand what architects do when they're designing the inside of a building. And this is important later on too. So here were some of the early deliverables, just to give you a quick run through on what some of the difficulties that we had. So our first real scan project was a church that had burned down after a plumber accidentally lit up a gas line. This was a historic church. The stone part of the building was was remain after the fire, but they had to recreate some of the windows because they had to take down all the stone and put it back exactly the way they had it. So we had a scanner. We were using it on a couple of topographic projects, and we say, hey, this would be a great opportunity for us to, to see what else we can do with this scanner. So we went out there, we scanned a few of the, all the facade, the remaining facades, and then it took us five weeks of more or less just a lot of, a lot of hand wringing and a lot of head scratching trying to get this point cloud into something useful for the architect. The, you know, keep in mind the computers were really slow. It took a long time to bring the point cloud in and out of all these programs. And after five weeks, we were able to finally give the architect some really good 2D drawings. Fast forward three years, so we did a few projects in between. We did a couple of plumbness studies. Next comes our first foray into trying to bring this into AutoCAD. So we were working on a project where we needed to provide basically cross sections of a ceiling. And we decided that, hey, we can export this now. Now we had the programs that come along a little bit. AutoCAD was able to take some of the point cloud information. So we went through, we created little slivers. These slivers were only half a foot wide of the ceiling, put them into a DWG file or DXF file, our computers here were able to open it. We sent them over to the client. We didn't hear anything from the client for about 
three or four weeks until they called us back and they said, hey, you know, we've tried everything we have and we cannot open these files. We do not know what to do. We cannot open these files. So we decided, all right, you know what? We'll take these photos, we'll take these images and we'll try to print them out. And just to print out each section, it took 45 minutes per page. So just imagine that. Fast forward, so that was 2005, 2006. BIM, rolled, BIM comes out, Revit comes out, sorry, not BIM, Revit comes out. BIM starts becoming more commonplace in the industry. And suddenly we, just, we find out we're using our scanner since it gets everything in 3D for doing a lot more different types of projects than what we're used to. And now there's a, a platform that we can present this information and provide it to architects. The hardware is coming along, computers are starting to get faster and faster, video cards are getting better, scanners are improving. We actually brought in some staff with architectural backgrounds who understood what buildings, how building systems work, and we were able to provide, these are all, all here shown, are all projects that we had worked on, and they're different types of deliverables. The one on the left in 2008, that was our first major Revit project where we delivered essentially a architectural plan of a hospital, we delivered some MEP rooms, we started to get an MEP modeling, and in 2014, we combined both, where we did both architecture and MEP in above ceilings in a very congested hospital. But it's kind of important to notice that through all this time, we were still using third-party softwares to do a lot of our modeling. The PCG engines that Autodesk used to provide for importing and bringing in point clouds were not that good. They really decimated the data. They made, they turned the point cloud, which is in the native format that we were looking at, they turned it into a, a very cumbersome object. They decimated a lot of the points, which means you, a lot of, use a, you lose a lot of the detail. So we had to do it in either a third-party program and bring it into AutoCAD or Revit, or use a plugin to bring those point clouds in. And here's just an example of some of the projects that we worked on. This is that same project where we went back, we rescanned, and this time we provided models instead of the 2D sections that took forever to print. Here's another, here's another example of a project. We started incorporating our civil, site civil practice into our, to the scanning work, and here's a project where we combined both exterior scanning, exterior topographic surveys with an interior hospitals project. And here's that giant hospital project we had done where we had both above ceiling, MEP, architecture, and it was a very, very unique project. We also have, we also started using Revit for more infrastructure projects. This project is out in uh, the, out in Dubai, and it was a, a project that we had scanned and converted into a Revit model to use this giant opening here was going to be the home of a new building and the architect team on this wanted to use a Revit model of the existing structure around it so that they could tie in. So then comes along in 2014 really, 2013-2014 recap. Recap really changed the game for us because now you could bring in point clouds into, Auto, into Autodesk products and it didn't just bring it in like it did on the old PCG files, it brought it in without any decimation it supported color and intensity values. Intensity is what we is the is a type of data that you get from the scanner when that, based on the reflective material, but it, it allows you to see different colors. So you'd see paint versus stone versus metal. And all of this was supported in recap. So it really changed the game for us. And then as we found out, as more and more we got into that, that you get these huge point clouds. I mean we've had point clouds that are over two billion like what he was saying, over two billion points. A lot of times you have to, a lot of formats you have to unify to make it a one giant cloud. Recap can take, so you have, let's say you have 200 scans, you can take that 200 scans and then with Recap you have the ability to turn on and off certain scans, which really helps out on the ultimate user side. So that way you don't have to load up your entire point cloud every time you're working on the project. If you're working in one corner, you can turn on just those point clouds. And the other great thing that we noticed is that it worked all across all of Autodesk platforms, Revit, AutoCAD, Navisworks, Memento, Inventor, as uh, George had mentioned. It really, really changed the game because in the past we've delivered some projects with PCGs that were used in the, inside of Revit, but then when you wanted to have it inside of AutoCAD, if a different team member came along and wanted an AutoCAD, you'd have to re reformat that. So just to give a quick you know, I can talk about this all day. Here's a quick video of one of our technicians modeling inside of Recap now using the point cloud. So you can see this was a tr true colored 
point cloud. We went through here, we had scanned, we had used, it was a very tight MAP space. But you just see now just modeling just as you were, you know, he's modeling off the point cloud just as you were if this was a design model. So he's creating lines in there and drawing it up. And you can see it, the process is easy. It spins around easy, it moves nicely. And this was just cut, this little piece right here was cut using just a section box in Revit. He wasn't using any kind of fancy tools. There's no plugins. We're really looking forward to some of the pipe detection, but you know, regardless of that, it, it's still a much, much nicer platform. Anybody that's worked on point clouds before, they kind of understand like all the different tools, the reloading and unloading that you have to go through. And the resultant model came in really nicely. And this is a really cool video showing basically that entire space this is inside of Navisworks here. We just made a fly-through video showing all that was modeled in the point cloud. And you can see the amount of detail that's in there. There's no decimation of the point cloud. There's no any miscoloration. Everything just came in exactly as we had it in our, as it was scanned out in the field. Here's another project that we had done, some exterior and interiors on this particular project, but the exteriors came out really nicely. And this is inside of a recap. And when I saw these inside of a recap, I was pretty much blown away. Almost photorealistic that these are all actual point clouds of how it showed up inside of Recap. Typically in the past, when you're inside of AutoCAD, this would show up as one, one color, or maybe you could kind of grayscale it a little bit, but having a true color is was tremendous. Here's a, another project. This is inside of Recap, looking at just a floor plan view. This is inside of Revit with a black background. We use it a little bit better, but you can see that the point cloud just comes in, comes in beautifully. And this was, again, a true color point cloud. And here's another project that we did on the exterior. You know, the amount of detail you can see, you can make out the, the blue parking striping. So we'll go back to that. So it's, it's really been a game changer for us. The other biggest game changer that has happened is our, we have brought on mobile scanning to talk of, you know, to kind of build on what George had talked about with things changing with drones. We had picked up a mobile scanner about a year and a half ago now and the ability for that, we can now take that LIDAR data out of that mobile scanner, bring it into Recap. This right here was all done in, uh, I believe it was Navisworks, this, this video. And this is a tremendous amount of data. And this here was, was all captured driving around in a matter of, I believe it was 45 minutes to an hour they spent driving around. And most of it was to do is, most of their difficulty was trying to get a lock on the GPS signal, but this was all done using the, our mobile scanner, which, let me just fast forward to that, which you could see right here. Sorry for that. That's not working. All right. So, so anyway, so it's a mobile scanner now that sits on top of there. It is it sits on top of our our uh, mobile mapping truck. But I will uh, just skip right to that. So, so the, so recap really changed our deliverables. We're still seeing the evolution of that. You know, recap is still relatively new, even though it's been around since 2013. But it's really changed changed a lot. We're seeing an increase in demand for point clouds coming from architects, from engineers, from contractors, because they have the ability now to use it. Another another really big plus is architects and engineers that come to us requesting a point cloud before as before we would have to do all the modeling ourselves, give them the model, and that always turns into a lot of back and forth and a lot of discussion. There's always a lot of upfront discussion on how the model is created. We've had a few architects come to us and ask us for a point cloud because this way they can start building the model the way they want it because what would inevitably happen is we would hand over a model and the architect would spend a lot of time going through there and trying to fix that up. And it, overall, this has decreased the upfront cost by the owner. So a lot of people, some people have said to me over the past couple of years or the past year is, you know, don't, aren't you upset about this recap because now it's going to change your, your workflow. You're not going to be modeling anymore. And if anything, it has increased our, increased our work because now there's more people out there who understand the point clouds. There's a growing number of people. They now contractors they can use the point cloud themselves rather than having to spend the time and money to model it. They'd rather just get it, us provide the point cloud. Um, just a quick quick note about the standards. So one of the one of the concerns, main concerns that we have is with the as in, you know in the in the mapping industry with this is just maintaining the standards because a lot of problem is everybody gets a scanner, everybody gets everything in recap, and there's always a question about accuracy. And one of the biggest problems we've seen with people that have come to us and have had a bad experience has been a problem with the accuracy or a problem with the precision of the point cloud that they were looking to receive. So um, just to 
A few considerations, again, I mentioned the QA or data acquisition, the QA procedures. We have a very stringent process for, for a QA QC. As George mentioned, you can still use your point cloud, and we still use we still use targets for a lot of our just QA QC, so we have a quality control. So in case anything ever comes up, we know how accurate our point cloud is. Um, the project requirements, that's always very important. If, if there's an instance where there's a team member or there's somebody that's not capable, they're not willing to use the point cloud and they want to have just a model, that's something that needs to be talked about later on. And just the project team's ability to work with cutting, te cutting edge technology. We've seen a lot of project teams where we'll do scanning, we'll do modeling, but then another sub is brought on who just wants to see everything in 2D and that sort of can ultimately be a waste.